Thank you all for coming. Uh, as many of you know, my name is Norton Mesvinsky, and I'm a professor of history here at Central Connecticut State University. Uh, I also plan and coordinate the CCSU Middle East Lecture Series. Today's lecture is the last of the 2008-2009 series. And in addition, um, well, uh, in, in, in addition, it's my own addition to the series. By that I mean, as has happened in previous years with this series, the money allocated has, has previously been used. Hence, I, as previously done in the last couple years, have out of my own pocket provided the funding for the expense of bringing today's speaker. Um, because of uh, some controversy that has arisen over this session, I want to state this specifically. Those of you who have some mixed, have uh, uh, some objections to today's speaker, you have only me to blame. Controversy, of course, is endemic to the Middle East Lecture Series. I have brought, well, we have had, speakers who have presented views that to some other people are controversial. Different speakers have presented diametrically opposed points of view. This is a university, so therefore, so be it. My standard, my requirement for a lecturer in this series is that she or he is knowledgeable factually about one or more important issues within the context of the Middle East and that she or he has presented orally and or in writing useful ideas and or has engaged in useful activity in regard to serious, in regard to serious issues. Today's speaker, Lyndon LaRouche, measures up to the standard I have just set. A controversial individual for many decades, Lyndon LaRouche is a leading political economist and prolific author. He has been a pre-candidate for the Democratic Party presidential nomination. LaRouche has produced a series of economic forecasts dating back to 1956. He forecasts, for example, the present global economic collapse in an international webcast delivered from Washington, D.C. on July 25, 2007. LaRouche was born in Rochester, New Hampshire in 1922. He has authored more than a dozen books and hundreds of articles, many published in Executive Intelligence Review, a weekly magazine he founded in the mid-1970s, which is, I have personally discovered, must reading for numerous members of the United States Congress, United States State Department officials, other politicos in Washington and around the world, and many academics. LaRouche has been dedicated to a just peace in the Middle East for decades, working tirelessly for economic policies that can provide an underpinning to a lasting solution to a crisis that in some ways is rooted in the topic of his discussion today, the Sykes-Picot Agreement. LaRouche has traveled in the region, visiting Iraq in the mid-1970s and delivering a lecture in the early 2000s at the Zayed Center in the United Arab Emirates. He collaborated with members of the Israeli Labor Party in, becoming, in developing what became known as the OASIS Plan for high technology regional development centered upon nuclear power driven desalinization and high speed mass transportation throughout the region. At major Middle East oriented think tanks in Washington and elsewhere, uh, factual information supplied by the LaRouche Group and at least some of his views are regularly studied and considered. During the past year especially, when I have been uh, in Washington uh, starting a new P Middle East political think tank, I have witnessed this personally. One final word before bringing Lyndon LaRouche to the stage to speak. Some sharply negative attacks upon him have been made by some people on and off the CCSU campus. Material is being handed out, as you know, even though I wrote on the listserv that I urge groups not to distribute material at the sessions of the Middle East Lecture Series. There are other fora and other channels to hand out material. I told LaRue's supporters uh, before the lecture not to hand out materials. 
I have seen much of the material that's being handed out and believe much of it that I have seen is at best problematic factually and some of it clearly inaccurate. But we can discuss that at another time uh, because unwarranted attacks have been made against me for at least the last four decades. I suppose it's fair to say that I am especially sensitive to this kind of thing. My hope is that you in the audience will, play, will pay close attention to what Lyndon LaRouche has to say about an important topic. Uh, I shall, uh, I shall um, uh, field questions and answers uh, after his lecture, which is titled, The End of Sykes-Picot, Moving Beyond Colonialism in the Middle East. Lyndon LaRouche. Thank you very much. Thank you. I shall suggest that it is an error to talk about a Middle East policy. That is, I think, one of the reasons we have a problem with the Middle East. We keep talking about a Middle East policy. Instead of talking about a conflict in the so-called Middle East, we should talk about the Middle East in a conflict and the conflict is largely global, especially within the context of nearby European and related civilization. The, this is demonstrated, especially since the British took over the Middle East in a process which began with the development of petroleum in what is now called Kuwait by the British monarchy, and the petroleum development of this, for this monopoly was to changed the British naval fleet from a coal-burning fleet, at least the principal capital ships, to an oil-burning fleet. And the advantage of the use of petroleum as a fuel rather than coal was a decisive margin of significance for the British in World War I. Out of that, with the breakup of the Turkish or the Ottoman Empire, came a new situation in which the British, with their puppets in France, formed what was called the Sykes-Picot Coalition, under which the, the entire area was intended to be carved up between France and Britain as a joint colony as such. It didn't work out that way because you had an able Turkish commander who embarrassed the British very much during the First World War, who defeated the British and the French, and set up an independent Turkey, which he consolidated by proceeding to make agreements immediately with Syria to, in order to keep Turkey out of the Arab world, to save it from being embroiled in the Arab world, and who also made an agreement with the Soviet Union in respect to that border, in, and in that place created a nation state of Turkey, which, in a sense, has been a success. Not that everything has been successful, but that the existence of the state of Turkey has been a success, with all its peculiarities, which have shaped in its history. Now, if you look ba back on this thing and look at what the conflict in this region is, the conflict is immediately has been since those developments, since those developments of the late, late 19th century. This has always been an area of conflict. But people look at this thing and uh, say, this is a conflict among this person or that person. And more recently, since the end of World War II, it's been considered a conflict between Israelis or Jews and Arabs, which is also not quite true. We have, what we have to do is think of this, this area, as I said, as being an area within the world the Middle, the Middle East is a part of the world. The conflict in the Middle East is a part of a world conflict, not the other way around. But then look at it from a standpoint, again, of economics. What is important about this area, which we call today the Middle East? Why is it such a cockpit of conflict? Why has it been such a cockpit of conflict since way before 
anybody knew of a Jew in the Middle East. In the ancient wars among Egypt, among the Hittites, among the people of, of the Mesopotamia, and similar kinds of wars. Wars between the ancient uh, uh, system of, of Lebanon and the, its fight in the, in the region. The wars of the 7th century BC, which involved essentially the Greeks allied with the Egyptians against Phoenicia and the extension of Phoenicia in the Western Mediterranean being combated and controlled by another civilization there. So the, the conflict is ancient. Now, why this conflict? Well, we have to go back a little bit more to ancient history to understand these things because men are not animals. Human beings are not animals. Animals have no history. They have a biological history, but they have no cultural history. Mankind's conflicts of today are the product of a cultural conflicts in cultural history. And we must look back perhaps a million years to get some glimpse of this. For example, in archaeology, what, how do we distinguish in archaeology with the frail evidence we have of mankind's probable or actual existence then, say up to a million years ago? How do we distinguish between ape and man? Hmm? There's one simple explanation. If you can find evidence of a fire site together with a fossils which look like they might be either anthropod or human, if you find a fire site that's human, the primary difference of man from ape is fire. But fire is only a symptom. Fire is an expression of the nature of the human intellect, of the creative powers of man which do, does not exist in the ape. In lower forms of life than man, in the so-called biosphere, it is, the development is built in to the physiology and the physical circumstances. In the case of man, as the case of ancient fire sites, which distinguished man from ape in anthropology, we have the secret of man, which is ideas. Fire is the, is the illustration of the concept of discovery of ideas, of the concept of culture, of the concept of development of the human race, development of civilization. And therefore, to understand human behavior, we must look back as much, well as we can to ancient times to see that, as much as we can this pattern of distinction between the ape and man, between the biosphere and what is called the noosphere, the sphere of the human mind and its creative potential, and the ape lacking that kind of creative, creative potential, and all beasts lacking that kind of creative potential. So then we have to look at this question from the standpoint of humanism. And what do we mean by humanism? We also mean language. We mean cultures which are transmitted by or with the assistance of language. So we study man in terms of language, not merely because of the use of language, but because of the invention of ideas which do not start and end with the life of an individual, but are the transmission of ideas from one generation to the next. And so it is the development of ideas, the development of mankind over thousands of years, over even a million or two million years perhaps, of mankind, that we find the secret of human behavior at any point or location within history. And this is no exception, this so-called Middle East conflict. This, this conflict arose long after the period of about 17,000 BC, when the last great glaciation of about 100,000 years old, these glaciations are never quite simple, but they do have demarcations. And we're coming to the end of a warming period. As a matter of fact, we're already contrary to some rumors, we're in a cooling period. And the sunspot, uh, lowering of sunspot activity 
is one indication of a 10 to 11 year cooling period now in process. It's global. There are other factors involved, but as far as the sun's concerned, sunspot activity and changes recently indicate we're in an 11 year cycle, typically of the past, of sunspot decline and therefore a cooling period. We're also in a long term cooling period because we have another 100,000 approximately year cycle to deal with which determine long-term glaciation and deglaciation. So, the, in this, so in this process, there's a lot we don't know because a good deal of this planet was buried under many layers of ice, especially the northern hemisphere, for a long period of time. And during this long period of time, culture was primarily located in transoceanic or, or at least other maritime cultures, not land cultures. As far as we know, culture, human culture, its progress was determined by maritime culture, which in its navigation discovered the significance of astronomy, discovered its importance for man, which as, and for navigation itself. And these were, these were the leading cultures in the great ice age period in particular when many of our not, uh, calendars as we know them today, the ancient calendars and the markings of these ancient calendars became apparent. And then the ice began to recede about 20,000 years ago. And the rate of melting increased. Gradually the oceans rose by about 400 feet, changing the defi definition of coastline, making India much smaller than it had been in an earlier period. The Mediterranean was opened up as no longer a lake-like formation, but became a sea, a salty sea. And then about 10,000 years ago, as the Mediterranean rose, it broke through the so-called Dardanelles Strait and transformed what we call the Black Sea Lake it, from a freshwater lake into a saltwater lake with a freshwater underbase. So in this process, these changes are going on. Man is reacting to these changes gradually as the, as the Glaciation recedes. Civilization moves into land. It moves along the coast first, as we see in the 4th and 3rd century BC in the Mediterranean region. It goes through various crises, but there's a gradual inland movement. First movement is along the coast, maritime culture. Secondly, it begins to move upriver in the major rivers, particularly the rivers that are now being flooded by the melting ice from the glaciation. And in this situation, something happens. You have a culture whose leading characteristic in this known period was that of a maritime culture, not an inland culture. There were inland cultures, but they were not progressive in the sense that the maritime cultures were progressive scientifically, or the equivalent of science and in culture. So what now is the meaning of this area we call the Middle East at that point? It's an area between the Mediterranean, which becomes a center of growing culture, and the Indian Ocean and Asia in general. For example, let's take the case of Sumer, which is the first major civilization which emerged in the southern Middle East. This was an Indian Ocean culture. It was not a, it was not a Semitic culture. It progressed. It was a very advanced culture in many respects. Much of the idea of language, of written language, was developed there and influenced the entire region for a long time after that with the cuneiform uh, writings. But then it degenerated, and the lower part of the Mesopotamia became salinated because of a physical economic degeneration of the area. Then you had a, the Akkad, but then you had the Semitic cultures which were based upriver on the structure which they had adapted to from the earlier Indian Ocean cultures. And in this process, now you have a development, a powerful development between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean as an area. That remains to the present day. Then there was a change, a change more in the middle of the 19th century, or slightly afterwards. The victory of the United States in defeating the British puppets, called the Confederacy, in the Civil War resulted in a fundamental change in world history. Up until that time, 
The superior cultures in power were cultures which were based on maritime culture because the ability to move by seawater and up rivers, which were the large part of rivers, became the places where civilization, where economic power developed. Inland movement was difficult compared to movement across water. And so until about the 1870s, the world was dominated in terms of powers in the world by maritime cultures. And the British Empire's emergence was a product of that process. But in 1876, there was a change. The change was the Philadelphia Centennial Celebration, in which all of the achievements of the United States, especially though of the, of the recent period, were put on display in Philadelphia. People from all over the world, prominent figures from various countries came to see this. Japan came to see it. And Japan was changed and transformed from what it had been into an emerging uh, industrial power through visits to the United States in the context of the Philadelphia Convention, Centennial. Russia, the great scientist from Russia, came there and adopted a policy which resulted, among many other things, in the Trans-Siberian Railroad. In Germany, Otto von Bismarck, the, uh, the, the chancellor, had direct representations and negotiated directly with the circles of those who had been associated with, with, with Abraham Lincoln, and transformed Germany with many reforms instituted in the late 19, 1870s. Among these reforms were the imitation of the United States on one crucial point. We, as had been intended by John Quincy Adams when he had been Secretary of State, had defined a policy for the United States as one nation from the Canadian to Mexican borders and from the Atlantic to Pacific Oceans. Not merely a territory, but a nation which was developing in an integrated way to the development of the transatlantic uh, transnational railway system. Germany then adopted that policy for Eurasia, a policy of developing Europe, continental Europe and continental Eurasia on the base of transcontinental railway systems and the things that go with that. Suddenly there was a transformation in the character of economy for as far back as we know much history, from nation power, national power based on maritime power to national power or superior national power based on the development of inland transportation, rail transportation, and the industries that went with that. This was recognized by the British as being a great threat to the existence of the British Empire, which is not really a British Empire. It was a financial empire with headquarters in the Netherlands and in, in England. But it was not the British people that were the empire. It was an international financial group based on maritime power, which thought they could create a, a power dominating the world. And so from that point on, the great conflict from the Lincoln's defeat of the British puppet, the Confederacy, through the 1876 Centennial Con uh, Conference in Philadelphia. There's a great conflict between the British Empire as a maritime power and the United States as a model of transcontinental internal development of, of national areas. And the pivot of this thing, which became known as World War II, it started actually the first war was the assassination of the president of France, Sadi Carnot. Uh, on behalf of British interests, which made a mess of things and therefore allowed the British to begin to organize. In 1895, the British organized the first Japan-China War and continued that policy as a war of attack on China up until 1945, Japan attack on China. Japan was also dedicated to a war with Russia. Then the Prince of Wales, who actually ran the place for his mother, she was kind of dotty at that point, 
The Prince of Wales planned, planned to have his two nephews go to war with each other. One of his nephews was Willem II of Germany. The other was the, was the Tsar of Russia. And they, they were determined to start a war. Bismarck knew this and made an agreement with the Tsar of Russia that if anyone tried to get Germany to support Austria in a Balkan war, that Bismarck would kill the operation. And on that basis, peace was preserved for a while. But then Bismarck was dumped in 1890, and the process of war began. First, with the assassination of Saudi Kano of France, who was close to the United States and close to this policy. Then with the dumping, with the dumping of uh, Bismarck beforehand. Then with the launching of the Japan-China warfare, which continued until 1945, until August 1945. So he went into what was called a Great World War, but actually a whole series of Great World Wars, which have been ongoing since 1890, to, in fact, the, pre the present time. The conflicts of the world today are approximately the echo of this long conflict between the idea of the internal development of national territories and cross-national territories, as typified by great transcontinental railway systems and by technological progress, and the other side, the idea of maintaining a maritime supremacy, a maritime financial supremacy over the world at large. We're still there. Now, in this process, a time came at which Franklin Roosevelt had intervened in this process and had broken it up. Up until that time, frankly, from the assassination of McKinley, which was a key part of getting us into World War I and then World War II, up until that time, the United States was going in a bad direction or from that time on. We had bad presidents. Te Theodore Roosevelt who was the son of the organ or the nephew of the organizer of the Confederate Confederacy Intelligence Service, became president. And he was a loyal British subject. He made a mess of things. Then we had Woodrow Wilson, whose family was notorious for its leading role in the organization and tradition of the Ku Klux Klan. And it was Woodrow Wilson who personally, from the White House as president, launched the reorganization of the Ku Klux Klan in the United States on a scale far beyond any its existence ever before. Yeah. Then we had the case of Cal Coolidge, who kept his mouth shut because he knew he'd incriminate himself if he talked <laughs> in public. Yeah. Then we had the case of Hoover. Well, we say Hoover has sucked. <laughs> he was a bright man, but he had the bad politics, and he worked for people who controlled him, and he was their puppet. Then comes, comes in a man who is a descendant of a friend of guess whom? our great first Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. And that friend was known as Isaac Roosevelt. And Isaac Roosevelt had started the Bank of New York. Isaac was a close collaborator of Hamilton. And Franklin Roosevelt, who was a descendant of Isaac Roosevelt, in his Harvard graduation for, uh, uh, class period, wrote a paper in honoring his ancestor Isaac Roosevelt and his policy. So there was nothing accidental about Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt, who had to struggle against the people in New York and elsewhere who we would call fascists today, and they were fascists. They're still fascists, some of them. He turned the tide against them. And while he was president, despite the difficulties under which he labored, he went into the presidency with a very clear intention, of a very clear perspective. Roosevelt, in his presidency, made and implemented policies faster than anybody else could think of them. You look at that from his first steps in there. He knew exactly what he was going to do. He had to improvise in some degree. And all leaders of societies do improvise. They know what their mission is. Now they have to find out how to bring the forces together to accomplish that mission in principle, even if it has imperfections. And that's the way our system works. We are a people with many different views, 
and the way you get the job done is find a common interest in the nation, awaken the people to a common interest, and then figure out how to get the job done. And you do a lot of bargaining and negotiating in the process to get the thing through. The thing you count on, first of all, when you innovate, can you innovate in a way which is in the right direction? Are you laying the foundation for further steps which may correct what you have failed to do in the previous action? And you have to also educate the people. You have to educate them not by preaching at them and such, but by organic methods of influencing them to see things about themselves and about the world they have not seen before. And as people come slowly to a realization, sometimes with a jerk, of this is right, then they make another leap forward. And had Roosevelt lived, the world today would be far better and also far different than we've seen since Roosevelt died. What, if, what the world as it existed on April 12th of 1945, when Roosevelt died, and the day after, on the April 13th, when, when Truman became president, were two entirely different worlds. And I know I was in military service abroad during the, that, that transition period. I was in India and Burma. When I came back in the late spring of 1946, after a beautiful experience with the attempt of India to achieve its independence, the United States had changed. It was no more the United States of Franklin Roosevelt. The same fascist crowd that Roosevelt had kept under control while he was president was back in power under a puppet called Harry Truman. Harry S. Truman, no point, no, middle initial, no name. His mother had planned to have somebody with the name with S in it at, at some, a point at some time. She never got around to filling out what the rest of the S was. I don't think she cared. I don't think he cared. So we had, we had this process. Truman was a catastrophe. Eisenhower was a relief, but he came in weak. He didn't have the strings to control the situation politically. He did many good things, but he was not in control of the presidency. Kennedy got the idea that he was going to control the presidency, and he got himself killed by having that kind of commitment. When, when Kennedy was killed, well, Johnson, Johnson was not a bad person. He's a politician with all that goes good and bad with that appellation. But he was convinced that the three guys who killed Kennedy, who were of French provenance and the attempts to kill de Gaulle, would get him next. Three guns pointed at his neck was the thing he referred to before he left office that had frightened him all along. So he gave in on the Vietnam War. Then we had six, the 68 phenomenon. And what happened after that? Then we had a fascist president called Nixon. The guy was a fascist, don't get yourself. He was exactly that. Then we had our Ford, he didn't exactly know what was going on there. He was a pleasant guy, but a lot of th bad things happened under him. He didn't notice what was going on. You know? The guy's sitting there, and he's happy, happily sitting at the dinner table, and the rats are running all over it. You know, he doesn't notice them. <laughs> and then you had, you had Reagan, who was a complex creature with some good instincts. He belonged to my generation, an older version of it, and was very strong with, on the Roosevelt. But as we saw immediately, he adapted to the Truman administration very quickly. And that was his problem. I had some dealings with him which were very important and could have changed history for the better. They did change history. But we could have done much better if he'd been able to stick to his guns. But otherwise, he was a mistake. They just went rolling on. Then 1987, we had a recession which was as bad and quite or worse than the Depression of 1929. And then we had a terrible man, Alan Greenspan, you know, and what he came out of, that cult he came out of was not very good. The result was terrible. So we, we've gone through a process of degeneration of the United States since the death of Roosevelt, with ups and downs in between. But the cultural degeneration is great. Look, for example, you're sitting here at a university, and think about 
the product, what came out of universities, about the time I was coming back from military service to today, what's the typical situation? What kind of professions do people undertake leaving a university? I'll give you a case. We just had a, an affair that I participated indirectly in Ukraine, a scientific case. And we looked at the population composition of Ukraine in, term, in different age groups. We found that the scientists, those who could actually think in terms which were significant to Ukraine, were usually over 60 years of age, and the leaders were in their 80s, like me. Hmm? In Russia, you find a similar phenomenon. In the post-Soviet period, there was this orientation, which had started in Russia earlier, under Andropov and then Gorbachev, the destruction of the ability to produce, the destruction of the power of creative progress, and replaced by greed, to get money for money's sake and for the sake of the power of money, not to build a nation, not to make conditions better. And we had the same thing in the United States in general. We're now at a point that our nation is disintegrating. It has actually been disintegrating in direction of growth since April 12th of 1945, since Truman became president. I could go through the details of that, but I won't hear because that's too takes it too far from the subject. But we have been destroyed step by step by step by step. And because it came on slowly, like the boiled frog, we didn't react. We just sat in the pool while the heat the water came to a boil, sitting there contentedly, hold, holding the pool while the water reached boiling point and the frog died. We're like the frog that died in the pool. We've been going step by step down the wrong way. Now, come back then to the situation of the so-called Middle East and see the Middle East not as a, as a having its own history, but as the Middle East as something within the process of history. And some, the other part is don't look at the Israeli-Arab conflict. Don't ignore it, but don't look at it. Because the conflict is not determined by the Israelis or Arabs. It's determined by international forces which look at this region how? As a crossover point between the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean. The relationship of Europe to Asia. The relationship of Europe to East Africa and so forth. Therefore, what you're seeing is that. Now go back and say, where did the British get this idea? As they did with Sykes-Picot. Where did they get the bright idea of keeping the Arab population and the Israeli, what became the Israeli population, at odds with each other permanently, killing each other over land that wasn't worth fighting over in terms of its quality? Ask yourself, what is the development of this territory? What is the development of the conditions of life of these people? What is the development of the conditions of life of the typical Israeli? Look at the Israeli of the 1950s and 60s and into the 70s, the early 70s, where there was progress. What do you see today? You see decadence, accelerating decadence, and an increase in warfare. What do you see in the Arab condition? Decadence. And you, you sit there with despair and say, are these people just going to kill themselves into extinction? Kill each other into extinction? What's wrong here? Well, somebody's playing them. Somebody's playing and orchestrating the situation. Who? How do the British come in on this? We'll go back, for example, to the time that Lord Shelburne, who was the boss of the British Empire, at that time was not the empire of the British monarchy. It was the empire of the British East India Company, which had private armies and private navies and private funds and a lot of drugs. What, what we, we learned from that? Well, how did, how did Shelburne come into power? How did he become this leader in February of 1763 of the British, what became the British Empire, which was really the Brit empire of the British East India Company, not the empire of the British monarchy? That came later with Victoria. 
It came because of the Seven Years' War. What was the Seven Years' War? The Anglo-Dutch interests, which were largely banking financial interests, orchestrated a period of warfare among the nations of continental Europe, back and forth, playing the very skilled military commander of Prussia, the Great, in perpetual warfare, which resulted in the ruin of the nations of continental Europe through mutual warfare and its effects, such that in February 1763, the British walked in and dictated a treaty called the Peace of Paris, which established the British East India Company as a private empire, which led later to the formation under Victoria of the so-called British Empire. Since that time, this group, which is not a group of people as such, I don't think of British bankers as people, because they don't act like people. They act like clever apes, but with the instincts of apes. That what has been done, what was done in this whole period, especially in dealing with the Lincoln process, the Lincoln effect, and the 1873 effect, was not to engage a direct war against the United States, which they intended to, to destroy, but to subvert it. To, in, to neutralize the U.S. in its own development by various kinds of crises, but mainly was to destroy continental Europe and to destroy it by warfare like the Seven Years' War in Europe. For example, in shortly after 1890, when Bismarck was commenting on what had happened to him, he said, well, the purpose of this thing was to ruin continental Europe through a new Seven Years' War, like that which had led to that. We also had another example of this, the case of Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte was not an enemy of Britain. He was a tool of Britain. He ran a Seven Years' War on the continent of Europe as the dictator to the point that he ruined Europe, so Europe emerged, Britain emerged as triumphant in 1815. And it was only the emergence of the United States as a power, especially after 1876, that checked. And therefore, the British were determined to destroy us then. But they weren't quite ready. When we had the death of McKinley, the assassination of McKinley, and the introduction of British puppets, such as Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Coolidge, and so forth, as presidents, to what that signified. And we became a tool of the British imperial policy, rather than representing our own interests or representing what we should represent in our dedication to the establishment of a system of republics throughout the planet. So what happened, the British created, beginning in the late part of the 19th century, what became the Sykes-Picot Treatment. Now, one thing is crucial about this, in all of this, which angers me greatly because it, I'm angered at, not at them, I despise them, but I'm angered at my own people who, like fools, will kill each other over things that are not really worth fighting about when there are all other solutions to the problems and thus making themselves the common prey in their own fighting of each other of an empire. It's like the principle of the Seven Years' War. Get the other guys to kill each other, then you come in and take over the mess. That's the way the British Empire has always operated. This was conscious, too, because remember that Shelburne's, Shelburne's advice and counsel was the model of Julian the Apostate, the Emperor Julian the Apostate. What did Julian do which caused Shelburne to admire him so much? What he did was he abandoned Christianity. He canceled it, but not really. What he did is he put it into a kind of uh, temple of various religions and began to play with these against each other. Now, Shelburne's conviction was, on the basis of the study of the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, was that the way the British Empire should operate was the way it had operated in the Seven Years' War and the way it was to operate in terms of the Napoleonic Wars, and so forth, hmm? was to get the fools 
to kill each other, to play one against the other. Now, this is easy to do. If you get people who are, don't understand the principle of Westphalia, the piece of 1648 piece of Westphalia, you don't understand this. Our interest as human beings is not to kill each other or not to engage in killing each other for the purpose of trying to get power over other people. Our purpose is, should be to set up a system of sovereign nation states under which each group of people has, using their own language and their own culture, is self-represented. But these nations as such, so formed, must have a, also a common interest in the betterment of the general condition of mankind. The only thing that's worth fighting for is to prevent evil from happening to this, this effort and to promote this effort for the common aims of mankind. Because, because the human mind is based on creativity and because creativity is associated with the classical poetry, the best expression of classical poetry of a language culture, in order to evoke creativity in our people, so that our people may prosper and humanity may prosper. We have to promote the welfare of the other nation as much or more than our own. Because it's by promoting in them that which is good, which is creativity, which is the development of culture, the development of a physical contribution to human, human effort. That's what our purpose should be. Our purpose is not to compete with each other as such. Yes, compete in another sense but not to compete as hostile forces, but to compete in doing good and sharing the good and realizing that we must develop our people's creative powers through the age of enriching the use of language, especially as typified by poetry and music, to, uh, to think. And that should be our purpose. The problem in, you look at this thing in the Middle East, you say, this is a disaster. What are these two groups of people going to do with this damn warfare? They're going to destroy each other. They're going to destroy civilization by spreading this disease. What are they fighting for? To kill somebody else? To eliminate somebody else? Or are they fighting to make their own people more successful as human beings by finding ways of cooperation with people of a different religious or similar culture. The principle of Westphalia. So we get so involved with the issues of the Middle East, which we find we can never solve. The way we're playing it, we'll never solve it. We will make efforts. Maybe the United States, if it had the right president, could force a peace with the support of other nations. But without some force, there's no tendency for agreement in this region. There's a tendency for perpetual killing. And what many of us can do is try to ameliorate that thing and slow down the killing rate to keep, try to keep it from spreading, to get them not to do it for another day. There are no guarantees. There is a solution, a solution in principle. And the solution is end this blasted imperialist system. And understand that we, as a people, must develop our spiritual culture, that is the creative powers of mankind, to, to carry further the development of mankind from some brutish character by a campfire a million years ago or so, into mankind as we desire that mankind should develop today. That's the issue. In the meantime, we will fight. We will do everything possible to try to get peace in this area, because we want to stop the killing. But we're not going to tell somebody we've got a solution that is going to be accepted is going to work. We're going to say we're going, we've got a hopeless cause and we're going to continue to fight for it. But you have to understand that the problem comes not from these people, except that they're playing themselves for fools and fighting each other. They're both extremely poor. Do you know what the condition of the Arab, average Arab is in that region? Do you know what the condition of life is, the deteriorating condition of life of the Israeli? What the hell are they fighting about? Where's the benefit in the fight? But the passions are deeply embedded. The habits are deeply embedded. We can try to impose the influence of restraints. Try to prevent these crazy Israelis 
from thinking about an attack on Iran because that would be really a hellhole operation. That was he tried to intervene through diplomacy and through other influences to moderate the, te the tendency for self-destruction of peoples. But don't, don't believe that there's some solution for the Israeli-Arab conflict. There is no solution in that per se. That's why I said at the beginning here, don't look at the history of the Middle East. Look at the Middle East in history, and there you find the solution. Because it's being played, the whole region, being played by a puppet. I've got a similar situation in India. I've got a worse situation in Pakistan. Pakistan is about to die. It's about to be killed by U.S. advice and British management. The dumping of Musharraf was insane. He's not a good person, but he kept the country together. And the disintegration of Pakistan would uncork all kinds of hell in the higher region, entire region. So that's the point. We must grow up, and those of you who are in the university circuit, presumably approaching now the point of where people are graduating from either from that term in, in the university or going to on to some other education, should think of yourself not as just being university graduates or prospective graduates, but think of yourself as reflect, respecting the need for young Americans in particular to get out of the habits of thinking which have dominated our press and our conversations in recent times to realize we're on the edge of a disaster beyond belief, and to realize that what's needed is an understanding of history, not an understanding of something that's happening in some section of history. We have, for example, the power of the United States, just to include The United States has great power that it doesn't know it has. I'm greatly worried about this president, because I think he's cuckoo at this point. Is being managed by a bunch of people who are evil. But we have a mission. For example, we have now a disintegrating world financial monetary system. We now we have gone through a depression phase since July of 2007. We're now entering a hyperinflationary phase. It's a process which has a striking resemblance to what happened in Germany in the early days of the Weimar Republic. The Weimar conditionalities imposed by Versailles put Germany at that time first through a Great Depression. We in the United States have since the summer of 2007, the United States has gone through a Great Depression. The collapse of the economy, the collapse in the conditions of life, the, the accelerating rate of collapse of the conditions of life now have been those of a depression a deep depression like that which Germany experienced in the early 1920s. But then, in the spring of 1923, there was a change. And between the spring of 23 and November of 1923, the German mark disintegrated. The economy disintegrated and was bailed out by outside forces. It wasn't really bailed out because what happened is the people who had left came back and took over. And this led to Hitler. That was the year that Hitler came to power. In fact, it became a phenomenon. 1923. And it was that that made Hitler possible. That, allowing that to happen, which was done by the Versailles Treaty, which you don't do. So now we're in a situation in which we have to change our monetary system. We can reorganize our monetary system and the world monetary system. We can cooperate with Russia, with China, and India, and other countries whose situation as it stands now is hopeless. There's no future for China under the present conditions. It has lost the means of employment of a large part of its population. It cannot carry itself under these conditions, and there's no prospect for increase of markets for Chinese goods. Russia is also in that kind of condition. India, because it has a low export dependency, relatively speaking, is not as badly off. But 
the blow up of Pakistan will have an effect on India that will blow India up too. That's Asia, a major part of the world's population. Africa is already a disaster. So how do we do this? Well, we have a system we call the American system, defined by Hamilton. We can shift the world economy from being a monetary economy to a credit system, as specified by Alexander Hamilton. That is, we do not try to run a money system. The money system is finished. This money, monetary system as it exists, cannot be saved. It's doomed. But some people are greatly attached to it. It's like being attached to a certain lead weight. It may drown you <laughs> by trying to carry it. And therefore, we can go back to a Hamiltonian approach, the same approach that Hamilton used, which led to the formation of our federal constitution. That is, Hamilton was in a situation in which he was a key figure in Washington's policy. And he had a situation in which the banks of the United States, which were state banks, state chartered banks, were essentially bankrupted by the costs of fighting the war of independence. And therefore, he had to create a, a national government, a federal government, which by being able to reorganize bankrupt banks to prevent a chain reaction collapse would save the United States from disintegration. It was this consideration of the bankruptcy of the state banks of the former colonies at that time, which prompted and motivated the formation of the federal constitution. Our, our system from the beginning was therefore a credit system as our constitution provides. You cannot print money as such. You can utter money, you can utter credit by a vote of the Congress and the, and the President. But you, what you can do and what you, how far you can go is limited by this vote, by this action. So we create a debt, a debt commitment of the federal government. This is our system. It's a credit system, not a monetary system. European systems are monetary systems. They don't work. We have experimented with monetary systems and we've, we have destroyed our by doing so in, under this period. Because we did not think about physical values. We thought about money values. And said the money values will, so, will save us. The money values will help us. Like this printing of fake money now, which will never be paid. Debt will never be paid under these conditions. Not the existing debt. Therefore, we have to go back to the same thing. Again, go back to a credit system, as Roosevelt had intended on April, on April 12, 1945 as opposed to what Truman did on April 13th. And that difference between April 12th and April 13th is the key to understanding U.S. history since that point. We go to a credit system. We can organize and credit agreements like treaty agreements with Russia, China, India, and other countries. We, Europe can't do it. Europe's in a hopeless situation, Central and Western Europe right now. But if we do this, they will come in on it. We can rescue the system. We have to move, therefore, from thinking about conflict among nations and regions to the alternative to conflict by finding that which unites us to our common purpose as independent sovereign nations rather than seeking resolution of the conflict which we are now enjoying among ourselves. It's the only chance we have. And when you look at the possibilities for this region of Southwest Asia, the only chance is will come not from inside Southwest Asia. We will do and must do what we can with that area to try to stop the bloodshed, the agony, and prevent the wars. But we will not succeed until we've changed the history that is the world in which this region is contained. And that's my mission. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.